Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today I want to talk about تغيرات في الأحكام The changing of the status of a hukum because of a change in the situation. So we're going to look at many examples of this today inshallah ta'ala and what is it that I'm doing this for inshallah? I'm doing this because I want to show uh, the Muslims in particular that how dynamic, how flexible, and how awesome our law of Islamic jurisprudence is. And it's so dynamic that, you know, it is very, very different from the impression that people generally have of our Islamic law of our Sharia. And so this is why I am Alhamdulillah, I get the opportunity today, inshallah, if Allah wills, to talk about this issue in some detail. So, the first issue that I want to bring to your attention is that there was a law in Islam called Khums, one-fifth. Now, this is not the idea of the one-fifth that we give Khums uh, versus Zakat in the Shia Sunni debate. This is not what I'm talking about. But this is referring to the ayat in Surah Al-Anfal and other ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where 20%, one-fifth of the wealth that would come in to the, Muslim, to the Muslims through battles would be given to the Prophet Sallallahu and then he would distribute it accordingly, however he willed. There are different opinions about this issue in the Hanafi, Shafi, uh, Hanbali and uh, Maliki Mazahibs, but I'm not going to go into those debates right now. My only point is right now, the Muslims would conquer lands, and uh, a lot of the companions became quite well to do because when they would conquer the lands, the ghanima, the spoils of war, would be given to the mujahid, the the, the mujahideen, and uh, and one fifth of that would go to the Prophet sallallahu and he would distribute it accordingly. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa taala said about this state of events. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Fakulu mimma ghanimtum halalan tayyiba." Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "So eat what you have taken of the ghanima of the of the spoils of war." Halalun tayyiba. Wa taqullah inna Allah ghafur rahim. Okay. Fear Allah. Allah is ghafur rahim. Okay. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa taala said. Now, what is my point of uh, sharing this with you? When Umar radiyallahu anhu became the Khalifa, and the Muslims started to com conquer Egypt and Iraq and Iran and all the way going to China and and all these other parts of the Muslim world, well, if the the mu mu mujahideen the people doing jihad, they would get all these lands, what would happen? They would become super wealthy. So Umar radiallahu an, he changed the law from the nusus of Qur'an, from the text of the Qur'an, from the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu He changed the law to, now when you conquer the lands, now when you conquer the lands, it is going to go to the Islamic State. Okay? So now this was the fatwa of Umar radiallahu an. Okay, so what is it I'm trying to help you understand is that sometimes the nusus says something. The text, nusus or nas means the text. The nusus says something, the text says something. But the because you are not only looking at the law, you're looking at the spirit of the law. What is the purpose of the law? He teaches them the book. Meaning, يعلمهم الكتاب. Kitab means the law, the hukum of Allah. Okay? Kutiba alaykum as Fasting has been ordained for you. It's been written for you. It's a hukum for you. Kutiba alaykum al-kital. Fighting in the cause of Allah has been written for you. It's ordained for you. It's written for you. You have to do it. Kutiba alaykum al-kital. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يعلمهم الكتاب والحكم. He teaches you the law, but he also teaches you the wisdom behind the law. Now, Let's look at some other examples in the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, where something different happened at the time of the Prophet, and then something different happened in the time of the Khulafa. Okay? I'm going to share with you another example of this. Uh, the zakat on horses. 
in the time of the Prophet وسلم, they were not required to give zakat on horses. The same happened at the time of Abu Bakr, the same happened at the time of Omar, but in the time of Uthman, in which the Islamic Empire was at its greatest, the horses were no longer a um, kind of like a residential uh, commodity. Rather, they were part of the economic infrastructure. Now horses were being used to you know, take goods from one place to another. And they were part of the infrastructure, the economic infrastructure. And so when it became part of the economic infrastructure, something different was done from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, which was um, Uthman radiallahu uh, made the ijtihad, right, that you have to give zakat on horses. Uh, another example of this, right, is the issue of, in the same way, <clears throat> in the time of Umar, before the time of Umar, in the time of the Prophet, if in one city a person gave three talaqs or four talaqs or five talaqs or a hundred talaqs to a female, it would be his wife, yani, it would be considered as one talaq. The same continued in the time of Abu Bakr. But in the time of Umar, because uh, partly due to uh, his understanding of Quran and partly due to this particular verse of the Quran and don't take the ayat of Allah as a joke don't make a mockery of them and because what started to happen and this these verses are about talaq so just keep this in mind and because people started to say talaq in one sitting talaq 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 and started shooting like a machine gun and saying talaq and kind of like making a mockery out of this system and so Umar radiallahu and mandated that whoever does this, even even as a meaning, if you say three, then it is a talaq. It's no longer going to be the way that it happened in the time of Abu Bakr. It will no longer be in the way it happened in the time of the Prophet sallallahu And some of the mazahibs adapted one, uh, you know, the 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 ijtihad of Umar radiallahu an, the four schools of thought, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali, they adopted the school of thought that if you give three talaqs in one time, it's a full talaq, they go with the ijtihad and the fatwa of Umar radiallahu an. But other mazahib said no, that was specifically for the time of Umar, and so they adopt that even if in one sitting you say three, four talaqs, then it is still counted as one. But the point I'm trying to make is Umar radiallahu an tried to put an end to the mockery of saying talaq in more than once. And not only did he say that it will become talaq, and not only did he try to put an end to this mockery, but he also then said he will be lashed. Whoever does this will be lashed. I forget right now, it, it uh, escapes my mind, what was the number of lashes that he had uh, ordained, that whoever does talaq this way, he will get this many talaqs. He will get this many lashes. Okay? So a lot of times when we are looking at the law, we're not only looking at the law, we're not only looking at the hukam, we are looking at the, also at the spirit of the hukam. What is the purpose of the hukam? The law is subservient to its wisdom. And so يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the law and he teaches them wisdom of the law. This is why Quran says these two words together. يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the law but then he also teaches them the wisdom because the law is revealed according to the circumstances of the Prophet ﷺ and then we will use that spirit, that idea for things that are different from the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, so now let's look at another case. In the same way, the Prophet said, and this is in, uh, this hadith is muttafaqun ala, you believe. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you're going to give ta'zir, ta'zir is that the, you want to give a punishment for somebody who did a crime, but it doesn't meet the requirements, uh, or it's not one of the it's not one of the crimes whose punishment is given in Quran, and it doesn't meet the punishment, uh, it doesn't meet the criteria of a punishment in Quran. Okay, so you have uh, a certain punishment, right? And even though he did the, now you know there's a judge, he determines he did the crime, but it's not a crime mentioned in the Quran or the, or the Prophet. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the maximum amount of punishment you can give someone is 10 lashes. 10 lashes, okay? Now, Umar radiallahu in his time, 
there was a person who was taking care of the treasury. And, you know, he got the official st seal and he made like a copy of the official seal and he started, he made an, a copy of the official seal and he started to steal from the treasury of the Muslims. Now, he was discovered. Now, when he was discovered, Umar radiallahu an, he punished him how? hundred lashes. Even though he doesn't come under theft because of the amount he stole and because of the situation in he stole. And even though he does he, he doesn't come under theft but but then he should have Omar should have given him the punishment the prophet said for non hadud laws those laws that don't meet the criteria of hadud then that should be up to 10 lashes but Omar did 100 this type of situations should tell us something that Omar was looking at here's a public figure not only is just a normal person but he's a public figure who if he is not properly punished will send a wrong message to everyone else this perhaps you know there can there's nothing that says this is the reason or that is the reason but the point is that they did things when they did something that was different from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you find this in the personality of Omar qasada rasulullah and aisha also you know, you find these two types of personalities, those that look for the, the wisdom, particularly when you're dealing with a lot of people, you'll, if you, uh, if you, so one attitude, you can say, Ibn Umar's attitude, which is to just, uh, the Prophet of Allah said it, do it, that's it, khalas. Allah said, do it, do it, that's it. What is there to, what else is there to do, right? And then there's the attitude of Umar and Aisha and Ibn Abbas and other companions of the Prophet that, they looked at the what is the maqas what is the purpose what is the what is the real purpose behind this verse of the quran what is it really so that when this if the situation changes they would keep that spirit in mind they would keep that the spirit of the law in mind not just the letter of the law the big problem nowadays is a lot of times we as muslims we are very familiar with the law of the letter of the law but we're totally oblivious to the spirit of the law. You know, we do halal fine. The whole point was, the whole spirit was that don't live under debt. And now we've created halal financing. So what's, what's you know, and, and there's so many examples like that. So going back to this case, you know, because there's so many ayahs about wala tufsidu, don't do corruption, don't do corruption. Wala tufsidu, wala tufsidu, wala tufsidu. So this person, he stole from the treasury. He was like a secretary of the treasury. He stole from the treasury, and the Prophet, and Umar radiallahu anh did not give him the punishment mentioned by the Prophet, which is for 10 lashes. Over here, I might have to take a few moments to talk about why lashes? Why not put him in jail and prison? There's no concept of, you know, disturbing someone's life permanently for six months, two months, three months, one year, two years. Give him the punishment, give it quickly, and get it over with rather than putting people in prisons like animals in a zoo which by the way animals in a zoo is a great mistragedy upon animals it's it's a very wrong way of treating animals but i'm not going to talk about that i think muslims should never take their kids to zoos because this is not a place where children are uh you know uh treated uh, children are not treated properly i mean animals are not treated properly in zoos there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that uh, there was uh, a, a camel in a garden, right? There was a camel in a garden and uh, this camel had gone wild in the garden. And uh, so the Prophet said, let me open the door and, and you know, uh, deal with this camel. And they were telling the Prophet, no, 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 don't, don't go, you know, don't. And the Prophet went in, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as soon as it saw the Prophet ﷺ, it stopped and went into, it kind of like bowed down to the Prophet. And then it said to the Prophet ﷺ, that my owner doesn't feed me properly, he overworks me, and he also is planning to kill me. And when the Prophet asked the owner, that are you, you know, you are overworking him and you're doing this to him, and, and you are planning to kill him. And he said, Rasulullah, I didn't even tell anyone this. I didn't even tell anybody that I'm planning to kill him. So this animal, the camel, somehow knew that his owner is planning to kill him. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is the Prophet was himself very sensitive to how animals were treated. And if he's, if the Prophet went to his zoo, 
he would not be very happy and he would be you know maybe even because he's the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the alameen for all all of the universe all of the all of the you know the the all of the he's the prophet of Allah the messenger of Allah to to even he's the messenger of Allah even to the animals right alameen so that's one of the meanings of that ayah anyway so this man he stole from the treasury, and in order to stop the idea of corruption, Omar lashed him not ten times, but lashed him one hundred times. Okay? In the same way, from the time of the Prophet you know, if there was a murder, you have to, there are different things that can be done in a murder. One of them is diyat. Diyat means you have to give the blood money. Right? And who was responsible for the blood money? The relatives who were at the time of the Prophet responsible for making sure the money is paid to the victims of the person that was killed, it would be the family, the tribe. The tribe would gather its money and give it to the person that was the victim. In the time of the Prophet, in the time of Abu Bakr. But when the time of Umar came, he took it upon the state, the Islamic state would take the responsibility of making sure the diyat is given to the victim's family. They would take the ultimate responsibility. Okay? So, so what I'm trying to explain is, is that how flexible, how dynamic Islam is, and how the changing of situation, the, the taghayyurat fi al-ahwal wa fi zaman, and the changing of, of the time and the place and the situation can change the fatwa even different from what the Prophet did. But you have to understand the spirit of the law. And the companions of the Prophet did this. And no one objected to Umar doing this. You all know the famous uh, interaction Umar had when he wanted to put a limit on, on the mahr. And one of the women stood up and said, no, you cannot do this because it's in Quran, you can't do this. But how would Umar even think of doing that? Because he was again thinking about the spirit of mahar was not that, you know, you give mahar to uh, a lady to become necessarily rich. And that that the, the, uh, the amount is so much that the barakah of the marriage goes away because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more simple and modest a mahar is, that more barakah a marriage has. Right? And then even the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, things that, like, normally, like, for example, somebody came to get married, right? And the Prophet said, do you have anything to give her? He said, no. Or do you have an, even an iron ring you can give her? No. So then the Prophet said, do you, do you know some ayat of Quran you can teach her? And then he said, yes. And this was the mahar the Prophet used. Right? And so what I'm trying to say is that the normal law was to give something, some money, some wealth. But the Prophet allowed for certain people to teach ayat of Qur'an looking at the situation of the person. Looking at the situation of the person. There's another example of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you believe this? You know, there was a poor family, a poor family. They didn't have enough money to, like, have food, right? One of their animals, I think it was a camel, one of the camels died. And as it died, now you know what the Quran says? Hurimat maytata. Haram upon you is the dead animal. Now the animal just died. So they went to the Prophet and they say, you know, my animal died. And the Prophet said, do you have something else you can eat? And they said, no, we don't have something else we can eat. And so the Prophet said, okay, then fine. If you have nothing else to eat, then you can eat this. The dead animal, the Prophet allowed it according to the situation. Now, if the Prophet wanted to make the situation really difficult for everyone, it could have also happened. But the Prophet didn't want to create difficulty at the social level. Just even a small level of obstacle, a small level, it's, it's not necessarily small because it was the only animal they had and it died. But even a, you could say, a medium-sized difficulty, the Prophet allowed easiness in it and allowed 
التغيرات في الاحكام he allowed the changing of احكام no one else can be in a state where they can say yes you can eat the dead animal it's very hard to to take that and go against the Quran but but the Prophet did it sallallahu alayhi wa to show us and to teach us that if there is a difficult situation for example and I'm going to give a special lecture just on the idea of dururat what is that but uh, but what I'm trying to share with you here is that the changing of situation changes the fatwa changing of the situations changes the hukum changes the command in the same way in the time of the Prophet no one was allowed to enter into the private homes of anyone in the time of the Prophet, in the time of Abu Bakr. But in the time of Umar, the people that were made governors of the different cities, Umar allowed uh, audits of personal spaces of people. Umar allowed the auditing to go in and see the house. You know, if he's getting more rich than he needs to be, to the house of Khalid bin Walid, Yazid bin uh, Ibn Sufyan, and so many great Abu Darda radiallahu, so many great companions, Abu, Abu, uh, uh, Abu Jarrah, all these great companions. Omar said, if they're rulers, they're governors, then take, we have to take access to their privacy. So that, you know, because Omar was big on stopping corruption, stopping facade, it was a big part of his, a big part of his mindset, a big part of his mindset. It was not just, you know, just some normal change. There was an attitude, an attitude, an attitude from the time of the Prophet to the time of Abu Bakr. And then Umar radiallahu anh sees the world is changing. And now even though they have established a certain pattern, a certain sunnah from before, but Umar went against that because the spirit of the law demanded the different approach. Umar radiallahu anh didn't change the deen. But the situation changed. And so he changed his ijtihad looking at what would the Prophet really have done. This is a person who knew the Prophet personally and had a pretty good idea of what the Prophet would have done. Another example. Do you know there are eight categories of, of zakat? Right? It's in the Quran, the eight categories of zakat. Umar put a pause and a hold on one of the categories. He put a pause on that category. It's in the Quran. He put a pause on it. You know, he said, well, when Islam was weak, we used to give to the people. Mu'allafatul qulub is giving zakat to people whose hearts uh, could be inclined towards Islam. And you give them something so that they feel more inclined towards Islam. Also, there's an opinion you can give it to them. To the, this is specifically for the, uh, for the leadership. Okay, but anyway, this is a longer debate. What is Mu'allafatul Qulub? But Umar said no more. That was when Islam was weak. But now that Islam is strong, now that Islam is strong, we don't need to uh, do Mu'allafatul Qulub anymore. That was because we needed people's hearts to incline towards Islam. But now that our Islam is strong, and our culture is strong, and our culture is influential, and everything is then that he put a pause on one of the eight categories mentioned in the Quran I want to ask you a question okay I ask you this question a Muslim is married to, allowed to marry a Christian based upon certain conditions that she's an actual church going lady she actually believes in the Bible right but is that so appropriate in today today's world based upon the situation and what you see with what is happening with marriages and what is happening with children of people that are married to Christian women I know so many cases that come to me where you know they're happy when they're married but then they have kids and she's like uh, or uh, he's like I want to take them to the mosque and she's like I want to take them to the church and the fighting begins When Islam was strong, then you know, you bring in the Christian into your family and then you teach her about Islam and is that say, is, has the situation changed? I'm just asking the question. So now this was looking at the wisdom of the law, not just the law. Look at the wisdom of the law. Don't look at just appearances. Look at reality. 
Look at the spirit. What is the real issue? I'll share with you something so amazing. Abu Hassan Shaybani uh, quotes this hadith or this athar actually because it's a narration of a sahabi or an event of a companion of the Prophet Umar bin Khattab. Can you believe this? A man is married to a woman many, many years. He gives her talaq. The idda finishes. The period, waiting period. Now she's a free woman. He died and he got sick. He died in this time period. Now she's not married. He dies. But Umar radiallahu anh, distributes the inheritance and gives her her share exactly as if she was his wife. Think about that. Umar radiallahu anh, this is his understanding of what can be, what is the intent of the Sharia, the purpose of Sharia, the wisdom of Sharia, the spirit of the Sharia. Today, what would the Imam of the Masjid say? And I'm not pointing any fingers. I myself am at fault of being blind to the wisdom of Islam. And it should be clear, till today, the fuqaha, they maintain the original position, which is that once divorce is done, she cannot be part, taking part of the inheritance. But Umar did this based upon the certain and particular situation that was before him at that time. Another example, at the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, you know, in the time of the Prophet, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Hassan, Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. If somebody brought gifts, it was considered gifts. But Umar bin Abdul Aziz made the ijtihad that now in our time, gifts, they're bribery, they're rishwa. Kana fi zamani, zamani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadiyatan wa fi zamanuna rishwa. It used to be a hadiyah, a, a gift in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a gift, was a gift. But now any, any governor or any official receives any gift, it will be considered a bribe. Then anybody bringing any gift to any official, it would be returned back and said, no, this is bribery now. It was never done before this. But this was the ijtihad of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Going against the tradition, right? It seems like something very simple, but you have to realize it took a lot of bravery and a lot of guts and, and being true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to even do simple, to, to make a simple step even like that. In the previous times, it was not allowed by the fuqaha, right, including Abu Hanifa, to take uh, money for teaching Qur'an. It was not allowed. Because it was considered like you bought, the, you sold the ayat of Allah. You bought the ayat of Allah for a small price. You're teaching Quran and taking money for it. But then, the situation changed. It became a need that there would be people that are dedicated to teaching Quran and then they had to be given money. But this, the original was that you cannot take payment for teaching Quran. But then, later on, the exact opposite was put into place and all the ulama act according to the second fatwa, the fatwa that was put in later in the place, not according to the original. All of the fuqaha agreed. Abu Hanifa, the Sahibain, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, you cannot take money for teaching Quran. What happened? The opposite fatwa took place. Because it was the need of the time. People were busy. People started to specialize in what they were doing and so on and so forth. We know that wearing silk is, is for men is not allowed. But two companions of the Prophet wasallam came to the Prophet and said, if we don't wear silk, we fall into a skin problem. And the Prophet said wasallam that for you to wear silk is allowed. Which this particular scenario in this particular case raises a lot of questions because are you allowed to use something haram to make a cure is a major question and there is a hadith that you're not but in this particular event they were allowed to do something haram to have a cure 
in the same way, there's a rewire, a narration in which a man comes to the Prophet وسلم, and says to the Prophet, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I have been destroyed. I've destroyed myself. The Prophet said, what did you do? He said, I was fasting and I did the one thing that you're not allowed to do with his wife. And so the Prophet said, وسلم, can you let go a slave? He has no money. Can you feed 60 orphans? He has no money. Then the Prophet وسلم, tells him, okay, look, I'm going to give you some dates. You distribute this amongst the people. So he said, between the valley, the, the valleys of Medina, there's no family that is more poor than mine. So I'm going to feed my family. The Prophet said, okay, go ahead. Even though, Sutul Mujadila, Qad Sami Allahu Qawla Lati Dujadi Lugafiz Zawjiha wa Tashtaki in Allah, Wallahu Samyun, Wallahu Samyun Basir. In that surah, very clear what you have to do uh, and uh, in terms of sequence, not but not in terms of that particular hukam. That's a separate issue. But the point is, the Prophet وسلم, you know, تغيرul ahkam بتغيرul zaman. The changing of the hukam because of the changing of time or changing of the situation, تغيرul ahwal wa تغيرul zaman. And so that causes the hukam to change. Obviously, no one can do this type of changing of تغيرات the way the Prophet did وسلم, that, you know, because he couldn't free a slave, he couldn't fast 60 days, he couldn't feed 60 people. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, he couldn't feed 60 people and then the Prophet made it easy for him. Okay, then why don't you distribute these dates? But the, the wisdom the Prophet and the lesson the Prophet was teaching that based upon the situation and what is even considering what is easy for people and what is difficult for people, how the hukum can change. Another example. A person was working for a master in the time of Umar bin Khattab. A person was working for his master and this master didn't pay his slave on time whatever his salary was or whatever his wages were, the master didn't pay him. What happened? He needed money. He was in a bad situation. He stole. He stole enough that it meet the requirements of had for the hands to be cut off. In the day that his hands were supposed to be cut off, he was brought to Umar bin Khattab. Umar bin Khattab let him go after hearing the whole case. The employer who had to pay him the wage, had he paid him, he wouldn't have stole, he wouldn't have had the need to steal. So Omar told him, not only did Omar put a hold on the hukum of Quran regarding theft, in this case, but he also told the employer, you now have to pay him twice as much whatever you were paying him before, in this instance, you pay him double the amount. Because you put him in a situation where he had to steal. We all know about the, 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 that during a famine, Umar radiallahu an, for one whole year, put a pause onto the, uh, the, um, the punishment of theft. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that when you're traveling and if somebody steals, then the had, meaning the hands, will not be cut off. Because it's a difficult situation. Even like even that type of, you know, something difficult happening, something like traveling happening, and somebody does something that, that normally would require the had to happen, the Prophet said, if somebody's traveling, do not take off. Do not, you know, if they steal, and somebody's traveling and he steals, then, you know, a traveler stealing in the olden days, uh, that would be something someone would do out of, you know, sheer necessity. So, uh, let me give one last example of this, or actually, let me give uh, one example, uh, two more examples. Uh, very simple, okay? The Quran being put in the form of a book, never done by the Prophet, but then in the time of Bakr, they did it. 
right? You may see this as something very logical, but when you're looking at this in terms of, okay, you're adding something to the deen even, right? You're doing something new into the deen even. So, but the hukam changes according to the circumstances. And now many of the fuqaha say and agree that reading Qur'an in the Mus'haf, which didn't exist at the time of the Prophet, reading Qur'an from the Mus'haf is more uh, rewarding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than just reading Qur'an, let's say, in without the Mus'haf in front of you. Okay? So, uh, let me share with you one more example. Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ now when the divorced women, they reach their period, meaning to be either released, either that moment where you let them go, or you can keep them if you make, so that when they're in that, in that time period. فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ And when they have completed their term, فَأَمْسِكُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Then take them back in goodness, أَوْ فَارِقُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Or let them go in goodness. Now what does Allah say? وَأَشْهِدُوا ذَوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ وَأَقِيمُ الشَّحَادَةَ لِلَّهِ Can you see that Allah is saying this? That the divorce is being taken place and Allah says وَاسْتَشْحِدُوا ذَوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ Let there be two just judges or just witnesses amongst you. So that, but nobody applies this law anymore and it's right there in the Qur'an. The only group of people that apply this law till today are the Ahlul Tashayi, the Shia. Okay? وَاسْتَشْهِدُوا زُوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الشَّهَادَةَ لِلَّهِ And establish the shahada lillah. The witness testimony for Allah. So, you know when you get married, you have two witnesses? This is now when you're getting divorced. Allah is also saying, if they're getting divorced, let there be two witnesses. Or if he intends to keep his wife, let there be two witnesses. وَاسْتَشْهِدُوا زُوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ now, the point here is, this is no longer applied. Why? It's no longer applied because in the olden days, you needed the test, because when people got married or divorced, it was the witnessing that would make it uh, so. There were no institutions, there were no judges, there were no records, there were no files, there were no marriage certificates. So you have witnesses that act as marriage, you could say, certificate. Okay? Or divorce certificate. So Allah says, وَاسْتَشْهِدُوا ذَوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الشَّهَادَةَ لِلَّهِ And establish the shahada, the witnessing and the testimony for Allah. So, having the, 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 the judicial system that is like establishing the shahada lillah, uh, the testimony for Allah, where you have the, fi the files and the records and the institutions that say, yes, this person is married and this person isn't married. But before that, you have Zawa Adlim Minkum, you have two you have two witnesses. So because of the Tagayratul Ahkam, because of the Tagayratul Ahwal with Zaman, because of the changing of times and situation, the hukam sometimes changes. So this is the talk that I wanted to have today to show you that the the flexibility Islam has, the dynamism, the di the dynamicness Islam has, how dynamic Islam is in its legal, uh, in its in in the spirit, the spirit, the ruh of the of the law, is how important that you're not just looking at the obvious, you're looking at the spirit, okay. And so, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arina al-haqqa haqqa. May Allah show us the truth is truth to see deep into the reality of things. The Prophet used to pray, Allahumma arina ashiya kama hiya. Allah show me things as they truly are. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to appreciate Islam and to appreciate the flexibility in Islam and the mercy in Islam and in, in its rules and regulations. Islam is like a tree. You know, you the, the tree grows and changes over time. You can't really go back to the seed. You cannot go back to the mess the time of the Messenger of Allah. You cannot go back to the Quran in the sense that it is like when it was being recited by the Prophet. But the tree is growing, the Ummah is growing, and time is growing. And now 
the, the, you cannot go back to being a seed. Now you are a tree. Time is progressing and things are reaching their final stages in the progress of things as they have to be in this world. So, inshallah ta'ala, I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope you will share your comments, your thoughts, your ideas, and also share your appreciation for how dynamic uh, Islamic law is. And how, in other ways, do you think that we look at the letter of the law and we have lost the spirit of the law? This is something that we should need to spend a lot of time thinking about, that where have we lost the spirit of Islam and where we are still acting according to the letter of the law. Okay? Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ashhadu an la